Okay, thank you. So, welcome from my side. Uh, I'm the last one standing behind you and the lunch, I know. But remember that it's not me to blame if we are late. So, uh, And I hope I still can keep you awake and I will speak louder than your stomachs make sounds. Uh, this presentation is um, summarizes or presents some insights in things we have done in Working Group 3, which uh, was led by myself together with Eleni Hatzi, who cannot be here today. She sends her regards. Some of the presentation is also put together by Elizabeth Bismuth, who's a PhD student of me. She also cannot be here. So people have, some people have to work while we have fun here. Um, I will stick to the, to the structure that was given. Um, so I'll go through the introduction and the aims. What did we actually want with this working group originally, which was not so clear always um, at the beginning. Then we look at some of the achievements and I will close with some lessons learned. I don't think I have to repeat uh, motivation in general for VUI in um, analysis. I just want to point out the, this last point here, which is the specific purpose of Working Group 3. Or in the end, we said we aim at providing an overview and to some degree also some, some, some links and, 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 and access to these analyses and computations that are involved in the VOI analysis. Um, we want to give also guidelines on how to implement those methods and tools. Well, we've seen that VOI analysis consists of many different parts and we'll go a bit more into that in the next slide. Um, and in some of these different parts, we have quite elaborate methods, but very seldomly these have been put together to actually perform a VOI analysis. That's one of the challenges. Um, so we have been trying to, 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 to collect, identify, develop also further and, and overview these methods and tools so that people coming from different disciplines can access the whole set of tools and methods. This way, we also realize that the, 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 uh, not a small challenge lies actually in um, the vocabulary, the fact that people coming from different fields speak different, speak different languages. Um, people from health monitoring don't use the same terms as people that are more, from, more coming from the decision analysis point of view. And then there are people that deal with um, the reliability of structures uh, as their main focus. And again, if you say indicator, it means something very different to those people. <coughs> At least it meant <coughs> something very different to those people. And that's a challenge we realized also during some of the workshops we did and we tried to address. Okay, now next achievements. Personally, I don't like the word achievements very much, maybe because I'm a scientist and, and, <laughs> and it's somehow... You know, I, I prefer to look at what, what are the challenges, what were the challenges, and to what degree we have worked on this. We know that, we, that the work is not finished, and the more you know, the better you are, the more you realize that you still have to do things. You know? But of course, we have achieved a few things, and this, presenta uh, this presentation uh, goes through some of the things we have achieved. By the way, I forgot to mention that um, not only was Eleni Hatzi also the leading this group together with me, she also made the first draft of this presentation, so actually she did her work, even though she's not here. So we have, uh, like in looking at the pure output in terms of hard and, and soft um, outputs, we had actually produced fact sheets um, that reflect the work that that was done in work in in conferences in, in in the groups where we met, and I'm going to look at a few of those uh, a little bit. One thing we have done in the working group is to to come up with 
a slightly different scheme than the working group two has presented. It, we, we worked together quite a lot initially, also because it was not always clear to us, and it's still there's no hard border between <laughs> what working group two and working group three have done. Um, so we worked together, and we realized that, okay, for our purpose, looking at methods and tools, it might be useful to structure the problem in terms of, of an influence diagram right, that follows the decisions and the uncertainties throughout the process. The colors here are the same, same ones that you saw in the presentations before. So we use the same structures. Well, not exactly the same color. The RGB code will be slightly different, but still green, red, and so on. So what we have here in this influence diagram is a structured way of formulating a decision problem, and in this case, the VUI problem for SHM. Those green, greenish colored uh, parts here are, let's say, typically physics-based models describing performance of our structural systems and associated what, I, what we here call indicators. Well, again, we had this discussion about this term. It's not always used in exactly the same way. Basically, things that you can observe or that one can observe and measure to learn something about the condition of the underlying system. We then have here the somewhat red, orange color in my screen. These are the things related to the, mo the, the modeling and, and decisions on the health monitoring. So, based on so, so, so what you can observe depends on, on your, your, your system indicators and on your technologies that you use to, to make the observations. Um, and then, as we know also, very there's no benefit of all these health monitoring if we don't do any actions based on the monitoring results. That's what you see here. No? And then the actions will then change your system, hopefully make it better, reduce uncertainty, reduce, particularly reduce risk. And then all of this comes at the cost or at the benefit also, and in the end we try to optimize this. No? There's a time thing here, so that this thing is done in, this, I come back to that, and it's done in multiple time steps, so the, the challenge lies in the fact that we have actually a se sequential decision problem, which is kind of hidden here in this slide. Now, the main point of our working group was to look at these techniques here that are kind of high, seem to be less important, but actually are, are, are crucial. And these are different methods and tools used in the different parts of the analysis. And as I said before, we have to bring very different methods together. Well, not maybe very different, but different methods. We need methods to assess the structure, the deterioration models. We need uncertainty quantification, propagation methods, we need structural liability me methods, we need, uh, as also mentioned, you know, nowadays we have all these machine learning tools and so on that, that might go here. Uh, we have Bayesian analysis. Um, we also have economic assessments that it should go there. So there's a lot of different type of analysis and, 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 and methods that are needed if you really want to make this, this process, and there's basically nobody here who is really an expert in all these fields. It's not really, or well, maybe it would be possible, but I think nobody can claim that he's really the, the in-depth experts in all these fields. So the challenge was to bring this together, and the, the fact sheets in a way helped that. No? So just go through, a, and I do very quickly summarize, or mention, and just mention a, a few of those fact sheets that, that go here. Um, and are in the colors where they correspond to. And so here we speak of indicators. So in this case, we have the, the paper by, actually, Maria Pina, why did you ask about this question before? Because you wrote a paper about this, no? <laughs> I didn't understand why you asked a question. You wanted to know whether the people are aware of your own fact sheet. The thing is, your fact sheet is in working group three. So where it's, uh, this is a, so this is basically the review of, of vibration-based uh, damage identification methods, um, which is the okay, most common <laughs> studied type of, 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 of approach to, to SHM here. Um, it also has a survey of, of algorithms um, on, on the extraction of the condition indicators. Uh, we also then, and then there's another fact sheet here that, that 
is, is, is let's say much more directly applied is this real uh, case study where the the um, uh, the methods are applied to and, and also tested and particularly the, the effect of environmental influences on the health monitoring is is, is, is evaluated there also here maybe to just to quickly mention uh, we had the, the fact sheet on a large data set which available the for um, uh, let's say that it can that can be used to transfer the methods that we, we develop into into practice uh, looking looking at data from bridges i think it was from roofs from uh, all type of, of structures and then we have also specific some, some of the fact sheets dealing with very specific applications, from footbridges to struct ship structures. We also then have fact sheets that looked at nothing more broader on really the methods as they were applied. Uh, we mentioned already Bayesian analysis many times, and I will come back to that also. He, you know, this is a challenging Bayesian analysis is challenging in the, in the context of real structural systems, uh, where you deal with heavy models, where you deal with, with, with compl relatively complex systems. And we also have a fact sheet on uh, uh, robust uh, identification and prediction, so which was mentioned before by Costas. You know, so th there's a limit, th 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 there are some caveats to the Bayesian analysis, and if you're not careful, you might, uh, depending on what you do, and depending on how you choose your model, you might end up with very different results. And so there are also people try also to find alternatives to the Bayesian analysis. And um, Ian Smith here from Lausanne did a fact sheet on that in one approach. And then there is a very nice uh, fact sheet also by Bernd Lehrer here, who, who again uses these methods and applies them to two examples. One is uh, both related to offshore, riser response monitoring, and if you remember, the second one is the ice-induced um, strains in a ship hull. Okay. There's also some fact sheet here on that relates directly to the method for optimizing the decisions. This is a POMDP. Um, Method, which can, which is one approach of solving the sequential decision-making problem, uh, and I guess uh, Costas Papa Costa Dino is probably the best expert in this area in our field. Um, so he, together with Eleni, wrote the fact sheet on that. Okay, all these fact sheets are available. They will be uh, so. So I think that I don't want to go into the details, particularly because I'm not the one who wrote most of them. So. It's not complete, so as you see, there are so many, so many different methods that we need, and for each of them you could write multiple fact sheets, so for sure we are not complete. It's also not possible to be complete without writing, uh, let's say, 100 to 10,000 of pages. But I think we have a good starting point for somebody who is new to the field and wants to learn about key methodologies and tools um, in this area. So we also, of course, there was dissemination efforts. Uh, there were special there were sessions in conferences. People wrote the uh, papers uh, related to the cost action, inspired by the cost action, coming out of um, scientific missions. And this list is uh, much, much longer. I realize that the list on the homepage is actually not up to date. So I know at least of many other papers that are not there yet, but will be there. So there has been a lot of activities. And now, thinking how to do this presentation, so I was thinking, okay, I can just go on and give you an overview, but it's a little bit boring without getting into some depth. So I decided to f to look at two, just give a little insight into two of those works that have been done here. And you forgive me if those are two works that I've been involved myself, because those are the ones I can present best. So maybe I'll just give you five minutes. Um, of insight into some of the things that, that were developed uh, during the cost action. Uh, 
of course, sponsored also by other sources, but but it's a lot actually inspired by discussions and things we had here. Okay, one of the things that is really central to the we speak of methods and tools is that in the general case, at least, if you want to model the whole process relatively realistically, you end up with an enormous decision problem. Why? So I think you start with the monitoring decisions, you have already many options. But then, if in the pre-posterior decision analysis, you have to model the whole lifetime, and in principle, at least, in theory, all the possible options of how things could turn out in your system. So it starts with the deterioration process, in let's say this is the discretized time steps in year one, year two. So you have some you might have some deterioration. And if you think of a structure that is not just deterioration, yes or no, but it could be different type of deteriorations at different locations in the structure. So this is a huge but potentially a highly uh, already high dimensional parameter vector here. You have a system condition, which maybe you can simplify to safe or failed, maybe not. Then you have uh, inspections that you can do. You can also do additional monitoring. Yeah, you could decide to, to maybe put monitoring later. You can do inspections. You have outcomes of those, those monitoring inspections. Again, this is high pos possibly infinite dimensional parameter vector. You can then do some decisions on repair. Uh, maybe you can also change the, the operation of the structure. So there's many decisions again that you can do, and this is just for one year, and then it continues. So, so such a model really has a problem of being bo somewhat exponential. Uh, you have an exponential growth or polynomial growth, depending on what uh, you're looking at. And already a long time ago, people realized that this is, uh, in a general case, you cannot find an optimal strategy in such a situation, which means we cannot also we have some difficulties of identifying the, the, the value of information. Because it, it basically the assumption is that we do the optimal thing. But if you cannot actually identify the optimal thing, that's a bit of a challenge. That's a P space complete problem. Um, now, so the what what do we do? Um, well, this is not nothing new. I will show you that it's actually completely old. But we can give it a smart name that comes from the let's say, artificial intelligence community. Um, so what, what, what we can do in, in, in order to approach the, the problem of this polynomial or exponential complexity with respect to so many having so many possible decisions to do, is we define so-called heuristic rules. Decision rules, they are called in classical decision analysis. And so we, we, we parameterize the problem by a set of heuristics. And some of you might, know, might be familiar with uh, the inspection, optimization of inspection, where value of information has been used since the 1980s, I would say, or 1990s. And some of these rules, for example, would be for, for, for inspecting components is, is that you, whenever your component or your system probability of failure reaches a certain threshold, you, you, you decide to inspect. Or more practically, that you, you decide to inspect every five years. <laughs> That's also what is implemented in many rules. Now, that is not going to give an optimal solution, because op pro most likely the optimal solution is not to inspect exactly every five years. But it has shown quite nicely in some publications uh, this gives a very good solution for a simple problem. This is a simple, a simple problem because it's not a system, it's just a component and just inspection. But we looked at now extending this heuristic approach, or as we call it direct policy search, uh, a term coming from the artificial intelligence community, I to, to, uh, to also with more complex systems. Yeah? So we don't only have a fixed uh, inspection interval or a threshold, but we also have the number of components to inspect. We have to have a heuristic for which components to, mo to inspect. What uh, We have to have a heuristic for, for what, how do we do repair, when do we inspect based on monitoring results. So one can we can add that and the we have looked at a bit into how to optimize, uh, for example, the locations of of um, inspection or monitoring by using a, 
a heuristic that, that says, OK, we, in principle, we should inspect or monitor those components that give us the highest value of information. Now, that is something we cannot directly compute, but we can find an approximation of the value of information. It somehow depends on how reliable is the component. It depends on the, the importance of the components in the structure. Um, and we parameterize this uh, by a parameter, and we then try to find, we, we then optimize the whole thing. Okay. Now, well, how does that help, this heuristic? And here we come to the, the way also back to, 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 to the challenge I showed with the decision tree. Hmm. So, we, in the end, we want to optimize life cycle costs. We want to find the strategies that minimize life cycle costs. So, we, so you, you are the operator, you, well, you're not the operator, but the operator comes to you and he says to you, tell me how I minimize my cost, hopefully. Um, and by cost, this of course included the risk and the, and the reliability there. You might have constraints, of course, but you, you want to do that. So you have to calculate the, the risk and the cost, which is the, which is the sum of risk, uh, inspection, monitoring cost, and repair cost. Now the risk is a, you, seems trivial again, is the cost uh, times the probability of failure. Everything here is conditioned on the strategy. So we fix the strategy, this is important. We say that, okay, now for, let's assume we, we have a fixed strategy and we evaluate the cost of that strategy. But even that is the still, has the still the polynomial uh, or exponential problem. And that is the uh, SHM outcome. Um, so that is a high dimensional, infinite dimensional vector. So w once we fix this, however, the good thing is that once we fix the both the heuristic and, and what we will observe in the future, are there's no more decision involved because the decision is, uh, is basically fixed by, by the heuristic and by what we observe. So when we simulate that, we can we can just directly evaluate for given set and s the risk because the dis this probability of failure here depends on your actions, but the actions are are prescribed by s and z. And here, we still need methods here because <coughs> we have a reliability problem. Still, you have a structural system, so you have to have reliability methods that actually can deal with this. And it's a you know, Bayesian analysis, so, so this is a very challenging problem. Um, but at least this is a field where methods exist and are, are being developed, for example, by Costas. And so we have... Um, you can use plug in those those methods. Uh, by the way, you might it looks trivial, but some things are not trivial at all. Like here you have a conditioning on set, and here you have a conditioning on observations up to time t, whereas here you have a, uh, it depends on the observations to the future. So in principle, it should also depend on the future observations, but we can show that it doesn't. But it's there are some things that here behind these simple looking formulas that are not so simple actually. This is a correct. So in the end, we, we end up with this expre expression. And then the good, the thing is that we then have to somehow get rid of the this fact that we don't yet know what we actually observe because this is always so random, right? high dimensional. But we can deal with this in a Monte Carlo approach. Why? Because the variability of this function is not so large because we have already gotten rid of the the. Remember, for probability of failure calculations, we need a lot of samples, rem remember? Because the variance in, the, in, the, in that indicator function is very large. But in the case where we have already done the integration over the indicator function, so we have already calculated the conditional probability of failure, the variance of this is not so large. So with a few hundred samples, you can, run, you can, you can solve this high dimensional problem. So there's no be better method than Monte Carlo at this point. And then you have to do an optimization, and that, okay, I'm not going into detail, but you have to optimize that it's a stochastic optimization, or you have at least your objective function is, is evaluated in Monte Carlo, so it's a, you have a noisy objective function, so better to use stochastic optimization. And we have been using is this cross-entropy-based approach that gives quite good results. Um, 
see here. And, and then you optimize all your parameters. So here's, for example, you have, okay, I'm not going to explain in detail what this means. We have a number of inspections, the, the time, and then some other parameters here. But you, in the end, you have, a, you, have, you have your objective function, and you can find an optimal strategy. And that enters then the value of information analysis. So this complexity of the decision process and together with, with the fact that we have also a complex physical process to represent is a challenge. This is an approach, um, but it's also not a sol complete solution yet. There are many things to, to, to do, and there are also other approaches. As I said, PUMDP is another approach that works better in some cases than, in, uh, than this. So that is one of the challenges. Now I'm looking at the time. Just very briefly here. I, I want to mention this because this is a, another challenge that, that we see. Um, is that we need, I mean, we have seen many applications, but, but often we are dealing with simplified problems. The real problem is a structural system. So typically we need a structural system analysis, reliability analysis. Because we need to know the probability of, we need to calculate the probability of failure in order to estimate the consequences and in order to estimate the effect of the monitoring system. And there are actually still not that many methods that can realistically calculate reliabilities for, for structural, for real structural systems. Yeah. So, so there has been work that, that was performed during this cost action, which was also reported in this cost action, on, on further um, trying to calculate the system reliability, conditional information. And always, we have to do it with a Bayesian approach in addition. And one of the approaches that was here developed by, by Ronald here in, in, in BAM is that it was um, where, where he looked at the system that basically that this is the case where a system is represented by a set of components. Each component can be in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in, in an okay condition or in a failed condition. And you can see already you have two to the power of n possible system states. And then trying to, 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 to find efficient methods for, for this type of, of, of system representation um, to calculate conditional probability of system failure in time. Here he uses uh, some sort of subset simulation based approach to deal with the high dimension. Again, this problem has a high dimension. It has many, many random variables. So this subset simulation works quite well. Works quite well. We will still have a lot of uncertainty in there. This is computational uncertainty, right? not modeling uncertainty. But uh, so these are some approaches that were developed and, and, and discussed and, and, and worked on during this cost action. Okay. Well, there was a try to. Uh, it's not complete yet. And still, you can still give inputs and free from feedback. But there is a first attempt of a kind of a database on on software that is available for uncertainty quantification and more specifically value of information analysis. Now, you will not find dedicated software packages for VOI analysis. What you find is software packages for U UQ, uncertainty quantification, for reliability. Um, so, but, but of course those, uh, have those tools boxes have many of the methods that we need for the VOI analysis. Not all, but many. So you can, you can find this information, um, uh, just to show one example here of, of one, one of the tools that is described there. Um, and this is available to the community. And since we are going to finalize this in the next, in this period, please have a look at it and also let us know if we have forgotten some things. Okay, finally, and this is mostly the work of uh, Eleni Chatzi and her group um, was working on a benchmark that is a benchmark for the, not so much for the decision part yet, but for the, for the, um, SHM part, and to some degree the structural part. <laughs> um, a lady is not here, so I cannot really give you many insights into the detail. I think in generally it's quite simple. There is a relatively simple case here uh, of, a, of a beam, three supports, 
you can in the, you have the possibility to introduce damage um, in these elements that are indicated here. So there are six possible damages one can one can indicate one can introduce, and then the structures analyzed uh, using uh, plain stress elements. Um, and there are many things that one can vary that are also in real life systems. No? Um, for example, okay, no, sorry, I'm skipping forward here first. Uh, you can choose here different deterioration models. You can uh, choose different environmental conditions, and the environmental conditions affect, of course, the properties of the model. Um, you can change uh, you can change material properties loads it's all it's also open source so you can modify whatever you like but there's also a, a python based uh, a GUI here which uh, helps to for people who are not so affine with uh, working directly with the code the points you see here are the points where you can basically get measurement data uh, so if you want so you can assume that there are there are sensors there you can also uh, and, and you can generate hypothetical sensor and the result, uh, and you've done that you can use to test your your Bayesian uh, analysis, your 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 um, SHM algorithms, and you could also extend that to. And this is something we're trying to, to 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 do is to extend that to test your whole BOI framework. Uh, so now let's assume you put there some sensors. Can you calculate the value of information of those sensors? As every benchmark, it. It, can, it only represents what you put inside. So it, it represents the uncertainties and the uh, environmental factors that are actually co encoded here. It might not include, it does not include, of course, what you, what you find sometimes in real data, uh, things that you don't expect at all. Uh, but it's, I think, a very nice tool to, for the community. Since I can really feel the hunger piling up here, so I'm concluding. And uh, just a, but a few lessons learned I want to mention. And it's very personal. Of course, if you ask people that participated in the working group, they might have also different, they might have very different uh, statements. Um, but I guess that at least some of those are uh, also common agreement. Not surprisingly, we knew already before that you need a multitude of methods that you need to do a VOI analysis, and that is also one of the challenges that we face. That at least if you if you want to do that, you you actually need to spend quite a lot of time. And sometimes, one thing we didn't do in this cost action, but what I want, what I'm thinking one should do is the the VOI of a VOI analysis. No? So, what is the value of information of doing a value of information analysis? And that might sometimes not, th it's not always positive, I would think. Particularly, of course, if the, if you look at the small, a small uh, problem. Um, so there is a, there is a challenge. Yeah. We have methods for basically almost all the individual tasks I showed you exist, but they're not always known to everybody, of course. Um, there's a problem with the terminology. And it's also a problem that we, we cannot come up with and say, okay, if we could just say, okay, from the best method in structural ability is this. The best method for assessing, for, for evaluating cost is this. The best tool for, for doing the pre posterior analysis is this. If we could just put it together, it would be great, but the methods we need and the, the tools we need that are best suited are very much application specific. And that is a bit of a, a challenge, so we cannot go and say, okay, you know, that would be nice. So if you have this type of problem, use this. If you have this type of problem, use this. It depends a lot on the, on the application, and it depends on the modeling that we do. And that brings me to, to, to maybe the fourth point, which is that, in my point of, from my point of view, the challenge in, in the real application typically lies in, in, in the modeling. So how do we model the problem? And that because you can make a model that is, is, is then puts a lot of burden on the on the computations, um, or you can make a model that is much simpler in terms of computations. Um, so the, 
the, the real challenge, and that is very difficult to 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 put in a in a, in a cookbook type of document. Say, okay, do this, do this, do this. Is the modeling, yeah. and we engineers always say, okay, this is what we can do. No, we, are, we are we are good in modeling. Everybody, we, we know which models to use and so. so. Um, but in VOI, this is really the challenge. This was the break for the the. the <laughs> it's the it's a lunch break, no? Yes. Okay. Just <laughs> my math teacher also always did five minutes longer than than the gong, so I will do that same. And or three minutes. Okay. So okay, I, may, I spoke about the heuristics. I was going to skip that. Um, system reliability, I also mentioned, is a challenge. Um, and as we saw also, that this, this, even this common vocabula vocal vocabulary is a challenge. You know? So I remember we in this workshop we had in Munich, and we speak about indicators, and after five minutes we realized that if you say indicator, you mean something very different than if I say indicator, and if somebody else said indicator. So, but we didn't realize at the beginning. We just and and and. When we write papers also in VUI, we always have this problem that, okay, we start out and we call this is A, A is an action decision. And then this is, and then we go on and then we, f we find that people in, in the mechanical modeling use A for something very different. It's the crack, crack length. And then you go further and you read a paper about um, the particular assessment of health monitoring data and they use A for, a, again, another thing. Yeah? And then you have to put these things together, you have to come up with with a different parameter, but then the person who reads this from, from, from the SHM community will not understand because A means something else to him or her. And this is, of course, always a problem of interdisciplinary work. Um, but the, the issue is that, this, that, that we have to somehow, or we, we also try in this cost section uh, to, 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 do that, to, to improve that, uh, to find a common, common ground to in which, with which we can communicate. Or at least to create this understanding that A is maybe something else than in my personal narrower field. No? All right, these were some of the lessons learned. Conclusions. So, we, just a repetition again. We need to combine different models, methods, and tools. It's th this is the, the, the interesting but also the challenging part. We have provided a a collection of methods and tools that that can be used um, that is now available or will be available also for the public um, to use and to start as a starting point for future work and for people who are interested in this field um, and participants of the working group have I think also at least in my case based on the discussions and we had during this cost action further develop methods and tools and in including develop the benchmark. That concludes this uh, presentation. And uh, I'm sure we have one or two questions. Uh, if you want to make yourself unpopular with everybody else, then you can now ask one or two questions. All right. <laughs> yeah, you really like, you really <laughs> like to be unpopular. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. No, no, nothing to do with it. <laughs> uh, no, I've, uh, in your uh, description of this uh, hu heuristic uh, mm -hmm. approach, you mentioned that the identification of which details to, to uh, monitor or to inspect, uh, that the selection would depend on a number of factors, of which also the importance uh, of, of these details, I assume, for the overall integrity mm -hmm. um, was one of the points. Uh, but uh, in this context, I just wanted to uh, mention that, uh, as, as you, you well know, uh, but you didn't mention that, so I will do it, that in the dependency, the dependency uh, b between the locations, the phenomena, the, the locations which you observe, and, and I would say the really critical uh, spots in the, in the structure uh, also plays a huge role and, and uh, it 
can in many, so there is a strategy where you actually, you design parts of your structure to be really weak uh, at a location where it doesn't matter at all if you have a super strong dependency between deterioration at that point, which may be an easy to inspect or easy to monitor location if there's a very strong dependency to the critical, the really critical and maybe uh, more uh, expensive uh, locations uh, to, to inspect. So like these, uh, I, I can't remember what we call them, uh, Daniel, but uh, like... Um, uh, yes, yes, I think the, but basically, yes, d so... D d dummy points or something. Yeah, yeah like uh, dummy like components or... Uh, Yes. Lack, lack and, uh, kind of testing, yeah. it, it doesn't really matter, but it contains a lot of information about yeah. places where it does matter. Yes. Yeah. So, that yes. That so, so in this context, maybe just to add to this, is that what we, what, 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 this is the fact that I did mention, is that the, prob the probability of, of, of actually having some, some defect matters. Yeah. And the reason <laughs> is that if you inspect something where it's quite likely that you have a defect, I mean, the, the thing is that we still with structures, and most structures that we're dealing with are high reliability. So 99% of the time you're looking for something, you will not find anything because they are doing well. So that means that, that it turns out that those components which actually are not, maybe are, are weaker, can give you more information because it's more likely that you might find that and that even if they are not the critical ones, they might serve as an indication for other components, which is, and it's the, through the dependence that you have. So mm. they, they are built by the, the same manufacturer, they are, under the same environmental conditions. Um, and yes, so this is one of the reasons, thank you for, for, for allowing me this clarification. No? So this is one of the reasons why yes, having a higher failure probability or a less a lower reliability gives potentially a higher value of information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To look at that part of the structure. And I, I would but also like, like to uh, address, uh, yeah, so you commented on Jan Smith's uh, approach for robust uh, estimation, right? And well, I didn't really comment on his, on his approach. I think I mentioned in the general problem that he is trying to address. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because I, I must admit <laughs> that, that, uh, that I, I also don't feel too comfortable speaking about his approach because I don't feel I have understood it enough. So we will not go into a discussion of that without Yen actually being here. Yes. Uh, but uh, also there was a, a comment uh, before about the significance of uh, choices on uh, possible priors uh, and how that can uh, seriously affect, um, let's say, um, ranking of decision alternatives in, in, in the end. Uh, I, I, so in, in with these two comments, I, I just want to highlight that I, I still think that this community is too damned determined to find one system and uh, is over uh, seeing uh, the, um, the importance of realizing that different assumptions, for instance, different assumptions on priors, that uh, they actually constitute different possible universes, uh, different possible systems, and you need to pull the effect of those possible systems into the uh, into the decision analysis in 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 order actually to appreciate um, uh, accounting for these possible systems consistently. I mean, there there is uh, in many many cases you can debate assumptions, you can debate uh, let's say uh, model ad ad adequacy. Uh, and in the end, you will, you will not come out with, with one uh, absolute model which can explain it all, right? Um, and therefore, you need to account for it. And robustness has to be seen relative to the ranking of decision alternatives. So uh, on this topic, on this aspect, I think we are failing. We need to make a slight turnaround and wake up to reality uh, and just realize exactly as you also mentioned in the beginning, the more we, we learn, the more we appreciate uh, that we don't know. And this, this topic is definitely one of the eye-openers uh, for myself, mm -hmm. yeah? Yes, but there's also an imbalance between the, uh, let's see, 
nice theoretical framework, which is not just nice. I mean, I, <laughs> I believe in that framework very much. Um, but there's also the, you have to make some amendments for the, for the reality of, 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 of real life that, that we often are not able to, 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 to consider all the models because we have just a limited num amount of time and we have to do something very fast and, or even if we had more time but given the fact that we're dealing with a problem in many different areas so that my point is that here I think these this, this concerns that, that are raised in, in, in this area not just by Ian Smith but other people um, in other communities I came across this first in hydrology calibration of hydrological models. Um, but is that these address issues that observe, are observed in real life. And um, there is also a Bayesian way to, to, to deal with this. But uh, I think this is something. But I think we should not uh <laughs> we should not make this into a discussion among ourselves, which we can have in the dinner. Uh, but maybe yeah. we should, if, if there's some other I don't want to. Actually, I, I, I took a course in how to uh, how to address uh, uh, nasty questioners. Uh, yeah, I, when I was a PhD student, I remember. But uh, I don't want to make this discussion short. But yeah, uh, just just one maybe one more comment. So what what you see in uh, in in much of uh, data driven uh, modeling right now uh, is that that. Uh, in, in appreciation that you might have uh, these uh, different models popping out of your data, uh, some schemes for model averaging uh, are also being applied. But uh, that, that then, uh, uh, let's say, averages the effect of potential different models uh, at the interface between the modeling and the decision making. And this is where we need to be very careful. We need to make the model averaging over the decision making, uh, and and this is uh, like a, a, a new type of paradigm. This is something to pay attention to. Okay. Yeah. But uh, okay, just one more question. But if I just want to say one, one sentence is that you, the, the one issue with this is that we have to. You're assuming that you know the utility function throughout your process, and this is something you often don't. But let's discuss this. Okay, w one more okay. Uh, question by question someone here, else, uh, by Jörg. Um, very short question, um, or maybe actually two questions, but the first one is, like, bridge design currently, or structural design, is based on the safety factor concept. Um, so it's not a full Bayesian approach. Mm. Now, there's two questions. The first part is, if you were, like, the one that does this generalization, standardization stuff, and you're... Um, would you move to a full probabilistic approach in terms of looking at what data do we actually have and how the design concept works? And if you, if you answer that question with yes, what is still missing to get to that point? Because you already said like modeling issues, what is the prior distributions? Mm -hmm. So how would we, if we want to do the full probabilistic approach, how should we go to that goal at some point from your point of view? Okay. Hmm. Well, first of all, I don't believe, I mean, I don't believe that in the near future we should go to a full probabilistic approach, maybe not even in the mid, mid, middle future, maybe in the long-term future. Uh, we, I mean, one of the, I mean, the, the, so I think there are also different steps. So one thing is, and this is something that we, I'm mean, looking at Jochen Köhler here because he's the, uh, the expert in this, really, but uh, we look at the, the, the code development that is done now. No? So there is a, there's a level behind the code which is, based on probabilistic analysis where we try to calibrate the code to that. Um, in principle, that basis could be used for, for, for directly designing structures. No? The reason why we don't do it is because it would mean that, first of all, everybody in the structural engineering community would have to be an expert in these methods, or at least reasonably well, not to make mistakes. Um, and there's also a question of, of what is the benefit in this? So what do you gain by doing everything probabilistically? And, and, and there's a balance of this. Today, uh, no, we sh today we, we should stick to the, the format as we have it now, but as we get maybe, maybe in 20 years, we don't have, maybe the computer is doing everything by himself. No? So, and, and for the computer, using at least these standardized probabilistic models, which are not necessarily the, we call nominal models, no? might actually be 
better to use than the, what we have uh, today. But the, the, what we realize is that the, the current code and the current practice is, is, is a strange mixture of, 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 of empirical, of empirical, let's say, knowledge and, and things that have gone into it by, by, by a huge community. Um, where people have, with, with a lot of experience, and, 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 and things have gone wrong, so that we have realized, okay, there is a problem here, we have to, to do something here. And the issue is that it's not very well documented in, more, in many cases. So it, we would like to think that, okay, the structure, we have, uh, it's, it's, it's a semi probabilistic this is a very short question, but a very long answer, I realize. <laughs> so I'm, and I'm afraid I'm, having, I'm not yet reaching the point where I see the, the closure to the question. So I'll try to make a very short answer, and then we can continue afterwards. So the very short answer is, um, I believe that the goal is good. We should try to go there. I don't believe we should implement that in the, in the near future. But uh, we should try to make the current COPE design also more, more, more clearly documented. We, we need to understand why certain factors are there, why, what is the assumption. Go away from this, or, or try to get, to the extent possible, rid of these empirically-based factors that are there somehow, that nobody knows where, why they came from. But, um, so, that, and, and, and so that we are able to, to slowly move into the, the process of, of formalizing, of better understanding the process, and then we're probably doing fully automated, fully probabilistic design in 100 years from now. Maybe. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you okay. very much for your presentation, insights, and discussion.